Today on this old house, this is a lot of color. It's like a billboard. You want this house to look good at 25 miles an hour. <laughs> right. And today, we start hardscaping with a cobblestone driveway apron. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. It's five bathrooms, it's a kitchen, it's a full new mechanical. It's, it's going to be a big one. Sounds like you guys have a plan. I think we do. <laughs> the money's in the detail. That is beautiful. Hi hey there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Narragansett, Rhode Island where we are just a few months away from finishing up the restoration of this 1880s Queen Anne Victorian. And you can see all of the details starting to come together. These historic accent pieces right here, well they are starting to go up. We have got the brackets here, we've got some rosettes and later today we're going to see even more of those going up. And the colors are starting to pop as well. So we'll figure out how to get those historic Victorian colors just right. And of course, we've got the landscaping work going on, Mark, and we've got a driveway going in. Look at the industry here. This is awesome. Oh, this is going to be a great driveway. We actually have a few things going on. Uh, we've got crushed stone as our base. So from the garage down to the curb, uh, crushed stone. Except for two aprons. We have to get off the street, so we're going to have to cut that curb. Then we're going to put a cobblestone apron there. Gotcha. And then just as you get out of the garage, as you can see, we have a cobblestone apron going in over here. So the house never had a garage before, not when it was built, not when we came upon it. So this is a beautiful little addition. But garage means cars, which means a ton of weight. This is not a walkway we're building. No, but this is why I love what these guys are doing. First thing they did was they poured this concrete pad. For the entire length of the driveway or just here at the edge? It's just right here at the edge. But notice the grooves that are in the concrete pour. Uh, very obvious right there. What's the reason right. behind those? So as you see these guys pounding the cobblestone into this grout mix. This here. Nice dry mix. When they pound those cobblestone into that mix, it's going to, there you go, it's going to grind itself right into that concrete pad and just kind of lock it together, which is great. So this sets our footing, um, so this is going to stabilize it, take all that weight for anything that comes over this area right here. And then on top of it, I mean, I, I am surprised at how dry this is, Mark. I mean, so, I'm thinking poured concrete or something, and that's not it at all. No, very dry mix. So the reason we want a dry mix is once they pound one down, it sits. When they put the others around it, if the, if the mix was too wet, each one would float. So that's why we want to use the dry mix. But you're telling me that this is going to set up rock hard in a couple of days? Rock hard. So if you come back tomorrow or the next day and you try to scratch that, Kevin, you're going to hurt your fingernails. Gotcha. OK. Yeah. Anything special about the cobbles? These things aren't uh, reclaimed or anything, are they? No, these are a manufactured cobble, which means they set them around nine inches this way and four or five inches deep, and they just bang them and cut them like that. As you can see, they go in. They look old school. They look like they have been recycled. but uh, it's a beautiful stone and a beautiful granite. So they're actually going for those imperfections to make it feel, I mean, they've been using these things for hundreds of years. Right? Hundreds Thousands and hundreds of years. Of years sure. Perfect thing. Um, and so I can see that they bang them in. They've set them to the line right here. Very nice. In terms of all these joints. Yep. These guys are going to take some of that polymetric sand. They're going to fill in all these joints. They're going to water that down. That activates the sand. Right. But what they're going to do is keep the joint down about a half inch from the face of the cobble. We'll set it down here, not have it come all the way up to the top. That's right. And they're going to expose the edges and the inconsistencies of the cobblestone. And that's just going to add to that authentic look. Almost as if it's a dried lay when you look at it from afar, right? Exactly. The other thing that we have to be uh, conscious of is there's a pitch on this garage floor that starts in the back and comes to us and drops four inches. Yeah, most people aren't aware of that, that the garage floor is not flat. That's right, but if you come in on a rainy day or a snowy day, the snow or the rain is going to drip down to the floor and it needs to drain. Yeah. So what's important about that is you have to know what that height is on the existing curb and you have to line that up with the height in the back and this door right here. So all of this pitch moves from that garage wall all the way to the front end of the driveway. And it has to be just on a pitch like that so everything drains. This is a lot of industry. I mean, we've got a big poured concrete base. We've got this uh, 
mortar, mortar? It's grout. Grout, yeah. I keep calling it mortar, the grout. And then we've got these beefy stones right on here. I mean, it's going to, I mean, we're not just building for the guy's car. We're building we for not. I pickup mean, trucks or. Well, don't forget, cars are one thing, but if you have to back up a truck to unload a couch or, or a piece of furniture or something like that, they're yeah. going to come onto this apron and you're going to need that beef. It's a truck. Another piece of detail that you're going to notice, Kevin, is look at what they're doing over here. All right, so what do we got going here on the edge? So you can just see that they're switching bond, and this is what we call a border. It's only two cobblestones wide, but it's going to shape the rest of the driveway. So it's going to start here, as yep. it does, and it's going to ride all the way down to the street. And it'll do whatever the blueprint tells it to do, but it's going to give it a little character, and it's also going to give a little visual. So cobbles for the apron, stone in the middle, and then cobbles along the perimeter. Right. And he just cut this right on site. I just watched him bang that sucker in half yep. right now, and he's just trying to smooth out those edges. Well, he's a good mechanic. That's what I love to do with my hammer when I cut an edge. That way it takes off like a clean break, and it looks a little more authentic. But this guy here, he knows what he's doing. He's got yep. the, he's got to hit a mark to keep the bond correct. And that's sort of whacking it into that, uh, that base right there. That's going to yep. set it in place. So that should give you some idea of the durability of this apron. Yeah. He has to use a three pound hammer just to bang these cobblestone into place. Well, I mean, I love the look. It is classic, and it's great to hear that uh, you think that we're in good hands with our masonry crew right here. So. Oh, these guys are good mechanics. I love what I see. All right, thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. All right, it. Kevin. Over the summer, Jeff's crew found some problems with the first and second floors here in the old part of the house. Not a surprise with a 100 plus year old house, but yeah. I mean, how bad was it? Well, we had 27 foot spans with the original material and you know, they was broken up into a whole bunch of different rooms. So the spans that those floor load had to carry wasn't really that significant. Now we want, you know, a much more open floor plan and we've only got six and a half inch joists which just doesn't meet the code for the loads that we're trying to achieve with the spans that we're trying to make. And, and when you uncover those original joists, I mean, were they warped, bowed, what'd you see? Uh, there was as much as two inches of deflection in them. <laughs> That's quite yeah. a bit. And it, and it had memory. It's been sitting like that for, right. you know, 100 years, potentially. Yeah. So those needed to be straightened and fixed. You had to add some extra beef. What was the solution? What'd you guys do? Well, straightened, yes, but also flattened. So we needed to get them, you know, perfectly flat. So we set up the string line across the top, and then we basically shimmed a temporary wall underneath it, shimmed up each one till it come up to the top of that string line. Yeah. And shimmed it and then put a temporary wall up underneath it. Then we ripped down two by eights to six and a half. We sistered them when it was straight and that will lock that into place. It also adds strength, so we have double the floor joist thickness now. And your sistering, adding an extra um, two by six, exactly. gets you up to code now that we don't have these individual partition walls here anymore, that we got these big wide open spans. Exactly. And then we put in the steel beam in front of the temporary wall, got that into place, and then we were able to take the temporary wall down and we end up with a strong, straight, flat floor. So we wanted to widen the stairwell opening, which means we had to cut the existing joists back so that they were shorter, and then we, with new material, head off the opening to hold it in place. So uh, how long did it take you? Well, it took the better part of a week. You know, we have temporary walls, they're wedged in. You know, you're trying to, you know, get those back out after we've got the wall all built, or the floor system built. And, you know, it's just a lot of, a lot of labor just muscling this stuff around. Exactly. It takes a lot of work to erase 100 years worth of memory out of that floor system. And this is what we end up with, which you've got to be happy with, right? Yeah, it's flat, it's straight, it, it, it's strong. Yeah, no spring, right? It supports a span that's now 27 feet. Remember, that was the exterior wall of the original house. Yeah, one wide open room, right? You didn't see much of that back in the 1880s, did All right, you? Right. All right, nice job, Jeff, thanks. Thank you.
So Jeff, I know when you and Kevin were walking around the house, you talked about this finial yeah. right here and yeah. these brackets that yeah. go right up there. Yeah, for sure. This this whole elevation, this whole gable end is just really spectacular it with is. all the detail. And uh, when we took it apart, it, it was basically, you know, really just damaged beyond repair. We were able to salvage enough of it to make the template for the new ones. And then we, we did them the same way you did them. We, we cut them with a bandsaw and then we cleaned them up with the router. Well, these look great. They're sanded up and they're all primed and ready to go. So what is this, Spanish cedar? Or Spanish what cedar, yeah. Yep. Very dimensionally stable. Obviously we needed thick material uh, and I think it'll last another 130 years. Yeah, we use a lot of Spanish cedar. It's great exterior wood. And I love the turning of this finial. This really came out great. Yeah, this is a, this is a nice finish and uh, it really, really came out great. Really sets it right off. All right, so are we ready to install? Yeah. All right, you ready? Yep, your end in first. Okay, I'm in, real tight. Uh, nice tight fit. I can nail this, I can hit this side because it's getting... Clamp on that. Okay, I Squeeze got it. the rest of it. Oh yeah, there it goes. Nice. All right. Yeah, now yeah, I got stay. some screw holes right over there, pre-drilled. Right. That grabs nice. Sure does. Plenty of meat back there. We can bung those holes and then uh, the painters will make it all disappear. Yep. Okay. All right, so I got one long lag to go in straight up here. Oh, yeah, that'll pull it in nice. Hold that up there. Oh, yeah, I felt that go up. Yep. <laughs> nice. All right, we take this off. Yep. out a little bit. All right, how's that look? That uh, looks good right there. Okay. Go screw in the bottom here. Oh yeah. Looking all right? Yep. There we go. Yeah. All right, we'll let the painters do their magic there, and that thing is a thing of beauty. It sure is. You know what they say, money's in the detail, <laughs> and that's a sweet that one. <laughs> okay, we're good. I'll mark off. All right, now we've talked about this cabana window for quite a while, the yes, issues of, of the challenges with this window. Yeah. So the window is about 250 pounds. Yeah, that's pretty heavy. But that's not the only problem. We're going to have a base cabinet here, and you're going to be two feet away on a long reach to get yeah, to it. Yeah, I mean, look, I can, I can push it out this far right, right here, and I'm leaning against the wall. Yep. But back here, no not way. So much. Can't do it. We thought about using the gas piston, which, is, which works. It'll push it up, but then how do you reach it to pull it back down? Yeah, you'd have to have some type of pole to pull it. Right. But then... How are you going to hold it against the weather stripping? Exactly. We want to be pinned against that right. weather stripping. So we're going to use these right here. These are servos, and basically inside this is a screw shaft. And at the end of the screw shaft, it pulls this piston down the screw shaft in and out. So it has pressure out and pressure in. And it pulls it tight against the weather stripping, eliminate the need for a latch. Like All right. It. Let's get them installed and see right. if they work. All right, so we'll pre-drill for these brackets. It's always a good idea to pre-drill a hole. That way, uh, it, the screw will actually hold better if you drill the right size hole in relationship to the shaft of the screw. Pin. 
Okay, good. So now we got to mark the position for this one. Yep. I'm going to pull the window pull tight. all the way. We, maybe we should put the pin in that. Right. Get the exact size, yep. exact spacing here. There you go. All right, good. Now I'll pull the window in tight against the weather stripping. Okay. And mark that hole. I want to be plumb here. Okay. Good? Yep. All right, so pre-drill the hole. Yep. All right, so now we're going to try this. Now, these are 12 volt DC, so your electrician's going to have to put a transformer in there. That's right, yep. but we'll try it with a little battery here, see how it works. See if I got it going the right way. Here we go. A little bit of strain, but when the other one's on there, you I get think the other work. one on there, it's going to work fine. And that's a beautiful thing. It sure is. <laughs> All right, so now we'll turn it around, bring it back down. It likes it that way. It likes it that way, yeah. I think two are going to work perfect. Yeah. And let's see how it does, pulling it against the weather stripping. Nice. That's perfect. All right. All right, let's get the other one on. Queen Anne Victorians have a way of screaming, look at me. They call attention to themselves. And up until now, we've been talking about how they do that with trim, brackets, and rosettes and such. But today, it is all about the color. And Harry Adler and Mike Moffat, gentlemen, good to see you. Nice to see you. are going to help us out with that project. So Harry, you're kind of the color expert here. Um, this is a lot of color. It sure is. The more color, the more people get overwhelmed, right? Well, it does uh, get confusing for folks to try to figure out number of colors and placement. So how do you help the homeowners work through you know, the whole list of colors? You have rules, you have guidelines, you counsel them, what do you do? Well, yeah, it's, it's a little of all of the above. You know, really, it's starting with uh, siting. You know, the, the house isn't sitting out in the hill by itself. In most cases, it's in a setting with houses around it, yep. with a roof color, with a foundation. And you want to consider all of that. It, it, so that's sort of the context of the neighborhood, the adjacent houses. What about the larger neighborhood? And in this case, the fact that we are next to the ocean. Does that weigh into your decision? Absolutely. I mean, you know, what weighs in is, is uh, where it is, if it's a city setting or versus a coastal setting. And also just personal preference. You know, people respond right. to color. And also, you know, historical information. We do refer to guides as to what would be typical on a different uh, architectural style. And the Queen Anne, how would you describe that to a customer? How vibrant, how elaborate should that be? Well, it's, it's detail and placement of color. So, you know, with a house like this, you've got, you know, outstanding detail. Let's talk about some of the specifics on this house. I mean, this gable end here is a perfect example of what you're saying, right? So that, that sunburst right there, you wouldn't want to make that one color because there's just too much going on. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to see what's going on, the way you do that is with color. Right. And, you know, so it's really uh, thinking about value contrast, color contrast, you know, because it's like a billboard. Something that looks very noticeable when you're standing a few inches away from it becomes lost potentially when you're 30 feet and driving 25 miles an hour because you want this house to look good at, at 25 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right. So when all of these decisions are done, Mike, you're the guy who's got to put it into play. You and your crew have got to make it happen. Yeah. Are there challenges that come with a house that is this robust? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, with a typical house, you got one body color, one trim color. So there's not a lot of prioritizing or selection you need to do, but you get two, three detail colors. It's like you need to, you need to make sure you guys on site know what color's going where because we've been to the end of the job and it's like, you know, no, this is supposed to go here, this is supposed to go here. And in terms of labor and additional costs, can you ballpark it? Is it 10% more expensive, 50% more expensive when you have this much detail? You know, a lot of the extra work comes in the details, which is the finishing touches of the, of the colors. 
Um, so you may have to make a couple trips around the house in addition to typical paint jobs. So if I had to ballpark, it's probably 20 to 30% more right. of a typical job. And is that the challenge, the details here? It is, uh, you know, believe it or not, it's when you get a four, five, six color scheme, it's making sure you get the right detail colors on the right detail. Right. Um, so really getting a mock-up uh, approval from the customer, okay, this color is here, this color is here. So you wouldn't ever do this without actually doing the mock-ups for them? Correct. Seeing a color up, to me, is not a good idea. It's the only idea. So you're a big advocate of samples. Yeah, you know, we, we make it um, clear that it's really a, a high-risk proposition <laughs> if you don't, you know. It's, it's uh, you know, you, you don't want to do a project like this hoping it's going to turn out well. You want to know it's going to turn out well. And so how far down the sample road do you advise people to go? I mean, are we talking about all three or four colors going every, up on every that? Every one of them, yeah. You know, everything's a detail, and there's no color that's unimportant in the scheme. So, you know, we, we really feel that getting samples up is, you know, these are, these are not inexpensive projects. And the most expensive thing that you could do is getting the color wrong and doing it again. Right. I mean, we get excited about these projects. You do? Yeah. I mean, it's, This isn't something that scares you or you, know, you wince at. New England, it's like, you know, paint it gray, paint it white. <laughs> so um, when you get some, a project like this, a Victorian, a Queen Anne, uh, when there's some details, I mean, you get all the colors right. And you actually, when you make job site visits, your crew's got a little extra pep in their step. You know, we call these our trophy houses, right? right. It's uh, one to put in our trophy case. So uh, we get excited about these. Well, when we got here, as run down as it was, an abandoned house, we were taken with its color selection, uh, its elegance, and so you guys have done a great service for us to bring it back and to bring it back respectfully. So thank you for that. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to see what's happened. Well, it's, and, it, and it's still happening. So thank you guys. Yeah, yep, no All right, well, we've got the color on the house, and next week we've got board coming into the house, which means plaster goes up and it won't be interior paint long after that. So until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor for this old house here in Narragansett. Red, red scares me. Next time on This Old House. I got a lot of recessed lights in the ceiling, so a lot of holes. But the other thing is, we're putting some AV equipment recessing the speakers behind the veneer plaster. Behind the plaster? I've been doing this show for, what, 42 years. I don't think we've ever been able to do a scene right next to a condenser and no, talk about it. absolutely. So pool on a truck, that's a novel idea. The whole idea is we can make them ahead in our warehouse in New Hampshire. We can do so many things ahead of time before it arrives to you.